Welcome to the Net Bible Church YouTube channel. If you haven't done so, please hit the subscribe button and click the bell to be notified of our new uploads. If you'd like more information about the Net Bible Church or how you could donate, please click on the link below. Thank you so much for watching. Pat Harrison was one of the speakers. Let me just tell you the lineage that you are under. Pat and Buddy Harrison started an organization back in Tulsa in the 70s before Rama Bible Church ever started. And it was called FCF, Faith Christian Fellowship. And our pastors went to their church and Pastor Becky was Buddy and Larry Huggins who worked in the church. She was their secretary. And um, so you know the connection with Uncle Larry. <laughs> we go way back with Uncle Larry. That's why he's Uncle Larry, because <laughs> he was our uncle in Chicago. So anyway, our pastors kind of were raised up under Buddy and Pat in the word of faith and, and the anointing and the moving of the Holy Spirit. And did you ever go to their church when you, were, when you lived there? FCF in, um, yeah. So you're familiar with how. So when our pastors came to Chicago, <clears throat> they came with that flavor. And um, so Pat Harrison was down there and she spoke a couple meetings, and she spoke um, one evening in a morning, right? And so that evening, I was just like, oh my gosh, the presence of God, I just felt like I was, at first I thought, I don't know what this is, but it's very, very familiar, and so awesomely wonderful. <laughs> and then I thought, oh my gosh, this is exactly the same anointing that was on our church that we had in Chicago. And so the next morning I was like, oh, I'm ready. Cause this is like, these are, she's our grandma <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the, Pat Harrison's our spiritual grandmother, amen. And trained up our pastor in Chicago. And so, um, and you know, we, as the, the church, as the whole world has been going through things the last few years that we're not accustomed to. And as, you know, the church has um, done some rocking and reeling that, you know, let me just say that God was not surprised or taken back by any of it. God knew. He knows what he's doing. And he's got this thing. And he's still going to do everything he promised. He's still able to do his word just like he said he was. And, but we definitely learned some things in the last few years. And um, one of it is definitely shook a lot of people's faith. And... Um, the Word of God says that, that we should test ourselves and see if we are in faith. So um, I think it, the, the things that we've gone through in the last few years have kind of shown a big light on our personal lives and where we are and what we need to um, sure up on and know. And so, um, <clears throat> so anyway, in that, like I like to say, anything from this moment past, we don't, the past is past at last. We don't look at the past, only what we can have learned from something, amen? But we're always looking forward to what God's, God is doing now and God is going to be doing. And so in that, we must, as the children of God, we must uh, ad adopt the attitude of being learners and always wanting to fine-tune and tweak what we know and how we do things, making sure that we are in the right lane, going the right speed that God desires us to. A lot of times, you know, preachers or, you know, children of God have tried to shoot out ahead of God and gotten a lot of trouble. And um, there's a lot of children of God that are lagging way behind and they're in trouble. <laughs> and so we want to make sure we're staying in step with the Holy Ghost, amen, and, and how vitally important the presence of God is in our lives. It's not just when we play the slow songs. The presence of God is with us 24-7. But we can do things to stir ourselves up to enhance the presence of God and the anointing in our lives. Amen? By giving way to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, we've been teaching on this quite a bit lately, the importance of the Holy Spirit and who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does. If you've been in church, if not, you can go to YouTube and you go look them up because <laughs> we're moving on. 
but we're not moving without the Holy Ghost. So in that, even in the message, whatever's being taught, whatever's being said, we're staying in step with the Holy Ghost. And you're embracing those things for a reason. Let me say, God sent you to this church for a divine purpose. And the divine purpose is not over. <laughs> Amen. Just because others have gotten out of the divine plan and purpose of God doesn't mean we have to. We're going to stay with God and stay with the program, mihas and nios. <laughs> We're going to stay with it. Amen. So, you know, just in saying that, sometimes as a, a, a minister, you can kind of have a, a gauge of your, your hearers, your, your, the congregation, or wherever you go to preach, you can, can gauge it. You know, like we've told you before, sometimes when I go minister, like in Hawaii, I mean, some of those meetings are, yeah, <laughs> they're just, uh, because the people come so expecting to hear what God is going to say, afresh and new, amen? Just like when you come when, when Uncle Larry's here or Margie's here, you're just so excited to see what and hear what God is going to hear, uh, say, and do because, you know, you just come with excitement. You come with ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying through certain people. But we have to adopt that attitude whenever we come to church. We can't make it like just, you know, we're in the habit of doing this, so here we go. No, it's stirring ourselves up that we're going to hear something from God and get divine direction because God knows how to take his word and deliver a feast to his people. Amen? I was telling Rev G, I said, I got so many notes from literally five meetings that I could preach the rest of the year on them. <laughs> it's... But you have to have ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And then you take all this information. And sometimes you'll hear something, you'll think, oh, that has to do with the, the healing that I'm believing for God for. Or that has to do with finances or a relationship with somebody. Or that has to do with my commitment toward the thing of God. The, my needing to know more about the Holy Ghost. So we have to have ears to hear what the Holy Ghost wants to say to us as individuals. So let's say this, Holy Spirit, open my ears that I might hear exactly what you are saying to me today. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Now just trust that you're going to hear it. You're going to take all those things and filter them through the Holy Spirit who's in you. Amen. So one of the things I was thinking about is how as a minister, when you're, when you're ministering, to people, like sometimes you get a gauge and uh, like like I was saying, you know, when I go to other places to preach, you know, it's like you're standing there and it's like they're just pulling it out of you, you know, they're just like oh, so hungry to hear what God is going to speak through you. And then sometimes, you know, like as a pastor in a church, the people are like, you know, I made it, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> but we have to be hungry to hear. And um, sometimes you, you can get a gauge that the people don't want to hear certain things. You know what I'm saying? You're like people, the people are there and they just do not want to hear about that. I don't want to hear about that subject. I don't want to hear about anything about commitment. <laughs> I don't want to hear anything about having to give more. I don't want to hear about that. I don't want to hear about anything that I have to do. Just tell me what God has provided for me. So a lot of people are in a lot of places at a lot of, and we've all been there at different places at different times. <clears throat> but uh, it all, you know, these things all stem from, from this, actually the same core. And um, one of the things I was thinking about it, we have to all be in the place that we want to hear the truth. <laughs> Do you want to hear the truth? You can't handle the truth. <laughs> we got to be able to want the truth, even if it hurts. I mean, I, there's, I've been in services where God just, read my mail and you ever feel like you're in church and you got a good spanking <laughs> like not youngest john but young john <laughs> is always saying after church man he, in so many words he got a whooping <laughs> amen if you don't get a good whooping at church you're missing something 
Amen. Because you ain't doing everything right out there. And all the things you ain't doing right is causing all the problems. So that means you need to come here because you know, sometimes we don't know what we're doing, but there's an element of we know exactly what we're doing wrong because we've heard too much. If this is your first time here, then you might not have heard, but, but it ain't. And we've heard too much and we know exactly what God has been talking to us about. And that is our, because we've been preaching on it for months, years, about our personal relationship and taking the time to get to know the Holy Spirit. Know the word of God. Stand on the word of God. Obey the word of God. Have time of prayer and intimacy with God. So what happens is when you come to church, sometimes there's certain things, you know, you're like, think you're open until somebody says something and you're thinking, well, that, that doesn't apply to me. Oh, oh yes, it does. <laughs> This all applies to everybody, right? And so we've got to, we've got to, no matter what's being said, if it's in the word, swallow it. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And so the, the bottom line is when people struggle, when the word is being preached, it's the, only, the one thing that it stems from is pride. Because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Whenever we get in pride, let me just, it all stems when we get off, it always stems from pride because pride, the reason God resists proud, the pride, when God resists pride, when we get proudful, the reason God resists it because pride, the very element of pride is a resistance towards God. When we get in pride in any element and you're like, well, I'm not in pride. There, that, that now you are. <laughs> well, I'm not in pride. <laughs> that would be pride. And we have to examine ourselves according to God's word, and God's word is truth. So <clears throat> let me just say, I am, when it comes to um, speaking the truth, I have been delivered <laughs> of the fear of uh, repeating the truth because it's all we have. It's absolutely all we have. God resists proud and gives grace to the humble. Amen. I'm not afraid of telling people the truth, even if they don't want to hear it. Because I know the truth is the only answer. It's the only answer for me and my situation. It's the only answer for you. So we have got to say, you know what? <laughs> Come to God. Hit me with your best shot. <laughs> Fire away because I need more truth. If we don't think we need more truth, then we're in pride. <laughs> Amen. We're in pride. Well, I know the truth. Then why aren't we doing the truth? Amen. So I'm not afraid because I'm going to be held responsible for telling people the truth. I'm, I'm not here to, what do they say? gain friends and influence people. I'm here to speak the truth. And sometimes when you speak the truth, you lose friends <laughs> and lose the ability to influence them. Amen. Just be just because people have pride and they don't want to hear the truth. Amen. So I'm only here for one reason and that's to preach the truth, to give the truth, to tell the truth. Otherwise, I'd be anywhere else in the world, but God, the creator of the universe sent me here to tell people in this community, in this region, tell them the truth. Tell them that God loves them and he has a plan for their lives. But it's got to be his way and not their way because their way never worked before and it's definitely not going to work in the future. So we've got to do things God's way. Amen? Amen. Aren't you excited about that? Too, 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 too many Christians... There's not one person that, if you say, you know, when people leave churches because they've gotten offended, it's different when God leads somebody. When God leads somebody, there's going to be a peace about it. You're going to know, you know, there's people that have left and gone to other communities, moved states, whatever. And, you know, there's a peace about it. They have peace. We have peace. Everything's just all nice and peaceful. But then there's that aggravation when people leave because they're offended and aggravated and get mad. It didn't happen overnight. People don't leave church just because one day they got offended. They got in pride somewhere. 
they get in pride. They get in pride. I know what I'm doing. I've got the word. I've got the Holy Ghost. I don't need this. I don't need them. It's amazing how all of a sudden sometimes people be around a big group of people and they're the most loving, kind, wonderful people. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, these people are so nice and they're so friendly. And one day they wake up and they go, nobody in that church walks in love. <laughs> nobody. <laughs> Not a one, a single person. <laughs> Amen. Something happened. They got offended because they got in pride. So we have, number one, we've got to make sure that we check up on ourselves, that we don't get in pride, because pride will cause us to get offended. And when we get offended at church, we have to understand things spiritually and how things spiritually work. When you're sitting offended at church, you have earplugs in. <clears throat> you have headphones that are sound resistant. I wear those on the airplane. And, you know, sometimes guys talking to me, I'm like, <laughs> it's like I got my earphones on, I can't hear anything. I'm just not, I don't even put them on to listen to stuff. <laughs> I just put them on to deaden the sound. We're walking around life with sound deadening earphones on to the Holy Ghost when we're in pride and we get offended. It's hard to hear what, what God is trying to tell us. Amen. Just want a little agreement here. Make sure you're swallowing it. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. So <clears throat> we have got to accept the fact when you got born again and you got, you're in this church, you've been filled with the Holy Spirit and that you are a part of a family. Everybody say, I'm a part of a family. The family of God. Now, some of you have had bigger families. Some have smaller families. I had a big family, and we were all about a year or two years apart. You get out of line, they're all going to let you know. And if you don't chip in, there's going to be a fight and some hollering. If there's work to be done and you're sitting on the couch, everybody's going to gang up on you. Has anybody ever been in a big family know what I'm talking about? If everybody's, somebody's going to be working, everybody's going to be working you're not familiar. Let's turn to 2 Peter 1.10. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. In 2 Peter 1, verse 10, I'm going to read this out of the NIV. It says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's a whole lot, a whole lot of stuff right there. And one of the things is, this applies to everybody, brothers and sisters. That means you have to be in the family of God. And once you are in the family of God, right, you have a calling and an election. And there's various, we're not going to get into the whole teaching of all the different types of giftings and callings and ministries that there are. That's a whole class, eight-week course. <laughs> Three nights a week for eight weeks. That's how long that would. But we're going to talk about the fact that you have some kind of a calling, and you've been elected by the creator of the universe. He made you for that, and that was made for you. And there's no satisfaction in this life unless we are in what God has called us to do. And let me just say, one of the things about a calling is it will have a tendency to evolve. When I started out in the Ministry of Helps, I was doing makeup. <laughs> I worked for a large, large television ministry, and I was a makeup artist, and I designed sets for TV shows. That was my Ministry of Helps. I was helping the ministry. I was helping these people look a little better on camera. I was helping the set. So when the camera was, so whatever was in front of the camera, I was helping that look a little better on the camera. So people viewed it. And that was my job. 
And then I moved to <clears throat> Chicago, and my first ministry of helps was <laughs> take the suitcase of Brother Hagen material to a Bible study on Tuesday night, and then take it Sunday morning to the church downtown Chicago. So I took the Bible, I took the suitcase to this Bible study. Amen. I took it to this Bible study on Tuesday night to Joliet. Illinois, and then on Sunday mornings, I drove downtown Chicago and took it there because that was their bookstore, and I was in charge of the bookstore. Uh, they found somebody that could take that suitcase from Chicago to Joliet and to where I lived in Park Forest. It was my Bermuda Triangle, and I lived within that triangle. And then they put me in charge of hospitality for whenever ministers would come, and I would take care of them. They watched me with the bookstore first. <laughs> I was a usher. I, uh, I did, um, I was a youth pastor. I did a whole lot of stuff in that church and loved every second of it. Thrilled to be used by God. Why? Because a church doesn't function without people helping. But see, that was when I brought that suitcase back and forth and schlepped it all over Chicago and the suburbs, that was my call at the time. I was called to do that. And let me just tell you, when I felt I knew that God was asking me and calling me to do that and take that suitcase, I felt so privileged to schlep that suitcase all over the place. I was the carrier of Brother Hagen books. Who I had just, let me say, I never even heard Brother Hagen. I just knew my pastor learned everything from Brother Hagen. So I thought, that's got to be good. This has got to be good. And then I got real familiar with Brother Hagen. But I was the carrier of the treasury of Brother Hagen books. And I thought, oh, I could live and die doing this. I am carrying Brother Hagen's books all over Chicago land. Amen. And then I became the usher. And I did it with all my gusto. I was the secretary. I had a little whistle because I didn't type. But I had to do letters occasionally. I let them know I don't type. But they'd give me something. Could you type this out? So when I got done typing, I blew the whistle. <laughs> Woo! I just typed a letter. <laughs> and that was before when we had typewriters. <laughs> Most of you don't know what a typewriter is. But the calling and election developed from there until before we left I was flowing in the Holy Ghost and the gifts of the Spirit with Pastor Gerald Watson I would give a tongue an interpretation and sometimes I would just give a prophecy sometimes he'd give the tongue I'd give interpretation and I was flowing in the gifts of the Spirit and where did I learn to do that I learned it by being the head usher amen I was the head usher and I was sitting there learning how to flow with the Holy Ghost in the service to where I knew right away, oh my gosh, he's going to do a prayer line. Guys, get ready. Here he goes. Before it happened. Because that's required when you're flowing in the Holy Ghost in the, in the ministry of helps. Amen. You just, the, that's how you learn how to operate in God's wisdom where you know things a split, second, a split, a split second before it happens. And you don't have to worry or fret or anything because you know the Holy Ghost is going to just let you know. And it's so exciting. It's so exciting learning how to flow with the Holy Ghost. And I learned how to do it in church. Amen. I learned how to do it in church, which taught me how to do it in my life, in my home, and playing worship. Just praying in tongues. Learning how to flow with the Holy Ghost. So he says, your brothers and sisters, make, let me just say, he did, make sure that you pa your pastor confirms your calling. <laughs> to confirm your calling and election. That means you have something to do with the calling and the election. And you have to make the effort. I can't make the effort for you. God's not going to make the effort. He's done everything he's going to do. He wants every one of us to make an effort because in Walking with God in 45 years, I didn't get here just because I got saved and thought, hallelujah, Jesus. 
I had to step out and do what God called me to do then. And not to say that it would ever involve into be full-time ministry, but every step of the way was exciting. And then I got to, I got to Rama, and somehow somebody, everybody's like, oh, I, I feel like God called me to work at Rama. I feel like God called me to work at Rama. And I was like, okay, well, then you'll get a job, I guess. And then somebody walks up to me and go, do you want a job at Rama? I was like, <laughs> and so I was like, ah, I guess. So I went and went and got my interview and got the job immediately. And the second year I was there, I was the supervisor of tape duplication for the students. Amen. I didn't ask for the position. And people kept saying, well, how'd you get the job? I really feel like God wants me to work at Raymond. I go, well, if God wants you here, then you'll get a job. <laughs> God wanted me there, though I didn't want the job. <laughs> God wanted me there. And so I, when I was there, I, I worked at Rama. I was I've been a part of ministry for years, but I wasn't looking to be in the ministry. I wasn't looking to be a preacher or a teacher. In fact, I told God, <laughs> thank you, Lord, that you haven't called me to teach until he told me he called me to teach. And then I said, God, I think you made a mistake. Anybody think God made a mistake? It says, for if you do these things, what? If you make every effort. If you make every effort to confirm your calling and election, you make the effort. For if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So what I'm saying is, I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying you're going to lose your salvation, but a lot of people have backslid so bad because they wouldn't step into what God has called them. They got out of church. They got away from God. And I've heard people that I knew that were Christians and spirit-filled, and they don't even believe in God anymore. They're going, I'm an atheist. I don't even believe in God. People that just didn't make every effort to make sure that their calling and election was to confirm it. Amen? For you do these things, you'll never stumble. That doesn't mean you won't have hardship. It doesn't mean that, that you're going to uh, skid by without the enemy trying to attack. But you're going to see some things, and you're going to know some things ahead of time. Some things you'll cut off of the past, and some things you'll be able to walk across water, and some things you'll be able to, God will part the Red Sea. There's a whole lot of ways that God can do miracles for those that are making every effort that they're calling an election is sure. Amen. I got the amen corner back there. Amen. So it says that you will never stumble and you will receive rich welcome, a rich welcome, a rich welcome, a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That means not everybody will get a rich welcome. They will show up and they'll be glad you're there and you'll be glad you're there, but it won't be a rich welcome. The rich welcome of, well done, thou good and faithful servant. A rich welcome. How many of you want a rich welcome? Isn't, look at this. Two sentences can change your life forever. If you just make every effort to confirm your calling and your election, what you're supposed to be doing. And it's always going to be a part of what's happening in the church. Because the church is God's idea. Amen? It's God's idea to have church. That we come together and learn how to flow with the Holy Ghost. Get saved. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. Get healed. Get delivered. Amen? And grow in wisdom and knowledge of the things of God. That happens at church. Not sitting on a golf course or up on a mountain or at the beach. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. In 2 Timothy 1 9, I'm going to read this out of the um, Amplified just because I like the way it tastes better. 2 Timothy 1 9 says, For he delivered us and saved us and called us with a holy calling. Whatever God has you do, when I carried those books around that was holy, that was such a holy thing. When I was slapping makeup on people, Ephraim Zimbalist Jr., 
Nikki Cruz. I put makeup on Nikki Cruz. I don't even know who he was. When I was putting Nick, uh, these were all people that were on TV. So they were all people that were somewhat famous, but I didn't know anybody. <laughs> but I knew that Effin Zimmel's junior was, junior was on 77, wasn't he? Okay. <laughs> 77 Sunset Strip. <laughs> Most of you don't know that, but that was the intro to a tele television show back in the, I don't know, 60s or something. But I knew he was on there. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. <laughs> Back in the day, <laughs> when I was putting makeup on, that was a holy calling. It might not seem like it to you, but to God it was. Why? Because he separated me for that purpose at that time in my life. When I was designing sets, I thought, wow, this is the dream. I'm just sitting here with paper and pencil and sketching out things and then drawing it and then coloring it. And I'm like, this is the life. I'm, get, I'm actually getting paid for that. Somebody's paying me to do something I really, really want to do. It's part of my calling at that time. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Sometimes you're going to get things that you love to do, and sometimes you're going to get things that you just get to do. You know what I'm saying? Because I also, when I was at my uh, church in Chicago, I actually cleaned our pastor's house. I was the one that got to clean their house and mop their floors and vacuum and scrub their toilets and make food. <laughs> as long as I was there, they were like, what are you going to cook us? <laughs> but then it opened the door for whenever they had guest ministers, I was the one at the house serving food. What a glorious, glorious privilege. Amen. He's delivered us and saved us and called us with a holy, holy calling. A calling that leads to a consecrated life. I wasn't so consecrated when they gave me that suitcase of books. I wasn't. I was a biker chick. Yep. I was tall, skinny, wearing four-inch heels with my skin-tight jeans and my black tucked-in T-shirts. <laughs> I was a biker chick. I wasn't so consecrated at the time. I loved the Lord. I loved the Holy Ghost. I just didn't know how to consecrate myself to the things of God. I couldn't go to church on Sundays because... That's when everybody went for motorcycle rides. So when I started going to church, I had to give up my Sundays. I was consecrating myself. I was consecrating myself to be there every Sunday and be there early. It's a consecration. Amen. It led to a consecrated life, a life set apart. When, you, when we... Everything that we do in whatever God's calling us to do at certain, at certain times and certain seasons, all of those things are going to set us apart from the world and the things of the world, and it's going to set us up in a place in the kingdom. Amen? A life set apart, a life of purpose. I'll tell you a little story about my dad. I love my daddy. I was my daddy's girl. And we could sit and chat. We had both had quality time. And we could sit. Nothing like sitting around a dinner table. When everybody swallowed their last bite, they said, excuse me, and they were gone. But I like to sit and talk to my dad for a couple hours. Very, very close to my dad. My dad was a, never at home when we got up in the morning because he was always gone before dawn. He was a hard worker, he loved his family, and he was fun, and he was funny, and we got along great. And I saw him with so much focus and purpose. He was a dad, he was taking care of the, his kids, and working hard, and putting a roof over heads, and food, and clothing, and taking care of us, and having fun. And as he got older, and kids started leaving, and the life just changed, and his purpose changed. But nothing sadder than the day that he was going to retire. 
because all his kids are now gone. Now he's starting to have grandkids. And now he has no purpose. But it doesn't matter how old you get and what you're doing in this life. With God, you always have purpose. The purpose of God for your life is your purpose. And you have to embrace the purpose that God has for your life right now. We can't sit and wait for something to happen. We've got to jump in with all fours and find out what God wants us doing now. Because if we don't start doing what God wants us to do now, you won't be ready for what he wants you to do later. A many, a many a young minister have jumped into the ministry because they felt a call and they were not prepared. It takes decades to prepare somebody for their last phase of ministry. And Brother Hagen used to say that. Most ministers live and die and never enter into their second phase of ministry. Whatever that might be. We have to consecrate ourselves. We have to set, we have to set ourselves apart. A life set apart. A life of purpose. Your purpose right now is to find out what your purpose is if you don't know it. And if you don't hear, we've got plenty of purposes around here. <laughs> Miss Elizabeth goes out of town and I was like, well, there goes the ministry of help. We got John sitting at, at the door. Sitting at the door, and there goes Miss Elizabeth. She does the children's. She cleans the church on the first Saturday of the month. She sets communion up. She's the greeter. She's, like, got her hats all on a rack, changing them on Sunday mornings. <laughs> it's like, and I'm like, what job are you doing right now? She says, I got to go greet. As soon as she's done with prayer, she's out there greeting. And all the untold blessings that she is in my life that have really nothing to do with this minister of helps, but it's a minister of help to me. I know she prays for me all the time. Amen. I know that she prays for all of you, and that's a great help for me. Amen. She is making sure, making every effort that her calling is sure so that when she, when she comes before the, for God, it's going to be a rich welcome. Amen. It's not going to be like, well, what'd you do? I don't know. I never figured out what you wanted me to do. Do you know I can't necessarily tell you what God has called you to do, but I can help you get on the road and show you how to find out what God has called you to do. Amen. It might be to carry a suitcase, schlep a suitcase of Brother Hagin's books all over the county. It's a life of purpose. And it's such a shallow, shallow purpose, just living your life to work your job, to pay your bills, and to save some money, and to take care of your kids. It's, it, it, taking care of your kids is such a blessing, but you can't do it without the help of God because all you do is put clothes on them, put a roof over their head. But they need, our kids need so much more than that. They need guidance. They need direction. They need God. Amen? We need to be on our toes to be able to to find out what's going on in the spirit. Amen? It's a life of purpose. Our purpose is to serve him. And when we serve him, there's just things we're going to know that we will never otherwise know. Amen? Not because of our works or because of any personal merit, we could do nothing to earn this. But because of his own purpose, his, everybody say his purpose, his purpose. And, grace. and grace, his amazing undeserved favor, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus before the world began, eternal ages ago, this has been given to us. We have been graced for the ministry of helps. We've been graced to flow in the Holy Ghost in our churches. We've been graced to be moms if we have children. We're graced to be dads. We're graced to be students. We're graced by God. But most important, we are graced to serve the kingdom of God in the earth and in this hour. Not with an attitude. Because... <laughs> We can have all of that, and it doesn't work. You find yourself on the bottom of the heap again. So we got to know what, what, how can we make church better 
for us? How can we make church better for others? Because it says that we have to help others. Amen? It's just not about us. I can tell, tell you some of the things that church is. Church, coming here, is a vital, mandatory. Everybody say mandatory. mandatory. It's a vital, mandatory part of anyone's call. And when you get saved, you got a call. You were born with it, but you can't operate in it until you get saved by the grace of God. Church is a vital, mandatory part of anyone's call. And first, first God said, don't. First, that we have to understand and know that church is always God's idea. Amen. And he said in Hebrews 10.25 in the New Living, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I just heard on the radio. <laughs> I was like, did he just say what I thought he said? I heard on the radio, he goes, well, it looks like they're talking about some kind of news and things going on over in Russia and stuff like that. He goes, I think the apocalypse is a lot closer than we think it is. <laughs> Do you think so? Read your Bible and you'll find out it's a lot closer than you think it is. And the Bible's very clear that these things are going to come on the earth suddenly, out of nowhere. Just like 9-11. You were minding your own business on 9-10. In 9-11, everything changed. Amen? In the Amplified, it says, and let us consider thoughtfully how we may encourage one another to love and to do good deeds, not forsaking our meetings together as believers for worship and instruction as is the habit of some, by encouraging one another and all the more faithfully as you see the day of Christ's return approaching. Something happened a few years ago that just knocked the socks off of the church. It's time to get your socks back on and get serious about the kingdom of God about church and about the word of God and about the Holy Ghost and about the anointing and about the things of the kingdom instead of all the things that everybody's been concerned about. We were concerned about things way before three years ago that we shouldn't have been concerned about, but we need to be concerned about God and what God wants for our lives as individuals. Amen? Hallelujah! So they're not running around looking for prayer all the time. No, God will raise you up and you'll be able to go pray for other people. So let us consider thoughtfully how we may encourage one another in love and to love and do good deeds, not forsaking our meeting together as some believers uh, for worship and instruction as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more vital faithfully as you see the day of Christ's return approaching. What's approaching? So much more than it was 2,000 years ago when it was written. And we don't want to be caught off guard. Even if it happens suddenly, we're ready. Amen? <clears throat> I was with my sister one time. She was very pregnant. And I had, my mom was in the, we were in the van. My mom and my aunt and um, she's driving on the freeway and had a blowout. <laughs> and she was on the inside lane, so she just pulled over. Good thing there was a big piece of dirt there. We were in Retro Cucamonga. <laughs> and she pulls off the road there, and she called the, you know, whatever, street assistants to come and help with the car. And they go, well, can you pull over to the other side of the road? And they go, no, I got a blowout. And they go, is there any way that you can change the tire? He goes, she's like, I'm pregnant. I got two elderly ladies with me. <laughs> She ain't talking about me. <laughs> and she's like, let me just say, when she got that blowout, she was prepared. She must have heard something about how to drive a car when you get a blowout. Because you can get a really bad accident when you get a blowout. He said, we're going to be marching through time. And you're going to be going through life. And you're going to get a blowout. A lot of people are going to get blowouts, 
But those that are walking in their purpose are going to know how to handle the vehicle when the blowout comes. You're going to know what to do. You're going to know how to respond. Yet a lot of people, the blowout's going to come, ah, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> Much like reels that you'll see on, <laughs> on Facebook. They show all these little snippets of bad car accidents. I like, I can't even watch those. <laughs> Or you got people got a camera in their dashboard and they're showing bad accidents. I was like, I can't watch them. <laughs> you got these accidents happen, crazy drivers running into each other and getting flats and rolling. People that did not know how to handle a situation. There's going to be a lot of things happening that we're going to know how to handle when it happens. Only because we are doing what God has called us and we're in the right lane at the right speed. Amen? But we've got to get equipped. We've got to be ready. So there's a lot of things we come to church. Here's another scripture. This is what church is, right? Like we just said. It's a place to encourage one another. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people. You can't get equipped when you ain't in church. And you only get partially equipped when you're only partially in church. Like I said, I ain't afraid to tell the truth. <laughs> because I'm going to be held responsible. Their responsibility is to equip God's people. That's why I'm just here to hand out equipment. You ever see one of those, what do they call them, the tool, you know, what do they call those? You walk up to the window and you get certain tools and nobody's going to help me. Nobody knows what I'm talking about. You know, when you go up in a place of business and you, they keep all the tools and the equipment back there and you have to go and get it. Or even in a camera place, you go, you have to go get, huh? The tool something, I don't know. Hmm? Yeah, something like a tool crib. He runs a tool crib. So you come up. So what you do, this is a tool crib. So you come, <laughs> and we hand out tools, and we hand out equipment. Think about how many Christians that are not in church are not equipped and have absolutely no tools. We're talking today about church and the vital importance of church in our lives and how much we need church. I don't know where I'd be, but I wouldn't be here. Amen? Amen. So it's to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church. So when you get in the church, you get built up so you can build up the church. Is this confusing? It sounds pretty simple to me, but I'm, you know, I'm just saying here. <laughs> Does it sound simple enough? Pastor Erlen, does it sound simple enough? Right. <laughs> Good. Hallelujah. So to do his work, to do his work, because we all have a work to do, Nobody's going to sit on the couch with a remote till Jesus comes back. We're all going to pitch in. We're all got something to do. And so, God, you come to church to get built up and get equipped. This will continue until we all, this is going to continue. It's not going to stop. Right? We get equipped and built up, <clears throat> build up the church, the body of Christ. And this, it says, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord. It ain't happened yet. <laughs> say oh my. <laughs> and say oh me again. <laughs> this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. What's your standard? I hope your standard's not somebody at your workplace or some friend or some family member. I hope that's not your standard. I hope, I hope nobody in this church is your standard, including me and Rev G. We're not the standard. The standard is Christ, the anointed one, the anointing, Jesus our Lord. He's the standard. Amen. Not some Hollywood. Well, okay. <laughs> Amen. 
We all have to come to the unity and knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Then we'll no longer be immature like little children that are still like learning the fundamentals. We have to grow up. It says moving on from the fundamentals. We should know the fundamentals. If you've been saved for more than three years, you have got to know what the fundamentals are. And if you don't, it ain't my fault. <laughs> Amen. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching because there's a lot of winds out there a blowing. And them winds blowing is pretty smelly. <laughs> yeah. There's some hur doctrinal hurricanes. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Let me just say, in the Garden of Eden, Eve stood there. And all she knew was walking with God. And somehow, that snake hissed in such a way it sounded good to her. You'd think she'd be thoroughly convinced. Every day they walked with God in the garden. But he was pretty clever and tricked her. And who do you think you are? Because you've been tricked up to this day. <laughs> Amen? Amen. So church is so vitally important because we have got to come. We've got to be trained. We've got to learn how to flow with the Holy Ghost in our personal lives, in church. Learn how to flow with the Holy Spirit in prayer. We've got to learn to flow with the Holy Spirit in the Word. Amen. We've got to learn how to flow with the Holy Ghost. Without resistance, just let it go. And let me just tell you a couple of things church ain't. So where there's no confusion. He, he, so we know that everybody is called to some capacity. And if it isn't full-time, it is part-time. There's no way out of this thing. You are called to be involved in the kingdom of God. And that is church. In some capacity, if you're not, like I said. If, so some people will go eventually from part-time to full-time. And some people will be full-time, but we are, I mean, part-time, but we live our lives full-time for God, no matter what. Amen? So we have to embrace the time that it takes to be trained in the things of God. Amen? Stumbling around in this life, church is not. Let me say, oh, church will hit you so hard that it'll impact your whole family. Rev G, you've heard the stories, Rev G, when he was a maniac before he got saved. But when he got saved, he got saved, he got so, he saved so hard <laughs> that it impacted his whole family because they all were like, <laughs> what happened to him? What's he being nice for? <laughs> Is he not wanting to beat somebody up? They were like, all right, we need to have a dinner. You need to come over and you need to sit down and you're going to tell us what is going on with you. <laughs> and so he was impacted by God. Let me just say, he had gotten saved in January. But not a lot changed until he started coming to our church in Chicago. And when he came, started coming to the church, the word, hearing the word preached, totally changed him. Of course, he was telling everybody he met a woman that he was going to marry. <laughs> we weren't dating yet, but obviously he was a man of faith. <laughs> and that's what I liked. <laughs> Just looking for a man of faith. <laughs> so he's sitting in his parents' house, and they're wanting, grilling him about what happened to him. So he got an opportunity to preach the gospel just simply at a dinner. And they all prayed and accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Just at one dinner. He was hit so hard with the gospel at church that it impacted his whole family. It rippled through. And so, and just let me say, how we approach, you, how we approach church is so vitally important. We have to approach church like our life depends on it. Do you know Why? Because our life depends on it. Our lives depend on 
not only going to church, but where we go to church, what's being taught. Do they have the Holy Ghost? If they ain't got the Holy Ghost, it's not a New Testament church. Get out. Get out fast. Run for the hills. Where you go to church is vitally important. When God takes you to a church that preaches the word of God by the spirit and the presence of God is there, look no further. God didn't make a mistake bringing you to a word of faith church that has the Holy Ghost. He didn't go, oops, I'm sorry, that's not the church I meant you to go. No, God knows what he's doing. Amen. So how we approach church, when we come in, if we just show up all, you know, that's what you'll get out of it. But if we come with an intent to be a blessing, to be focused, guess what? We will get focused and blessed. Amen. Church is not a picnic, though you could have a picnic. Church is not a picnic. Church is absolutely not a day at the beach. Church is not another day at work. It's not a day at the job. And church is not a sporting event. Church is when we come to honor God first and foremost. We are here to honor him. To honor him for all that he has done and for who he is. We have come to honor his word because he tells us that we should not forsake the assembling ourselves. We are honoring him and his word. We're coming here to glorify him because he deserves all the glory and the honor and the praise. We are here to learn and we are here to help. Amen. Amen. We're here to learn and we're here to help. They say, oh, you preach a message like that, they're all going to leave. Well, then God's going to give us a crop that wants to learn and wants to help. Because I want to do church God's way. I don't want to do, I'm, I'm not going to do church people's way. I don't even want to do church my way. I want to do church his way. And when we do church his way, and then we take what we learn here, and we take it into our lives out there, then it'll keep us from trouble. Because how many times have we said, if you hear and hear and hear, how many years have we said, if you just continue to hear the word only and not do it, you are deceived. You, you can't just come to church. You can't just schlep around and think I'm good because I got God. The squirrels got God, but they're roadkill all the time. <laughs> God loves the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, but they get burned up. God loves us, but it really has to do with what we do. What are we going to do? How much are we going to put into this thing? How much are we going to honor God? What is church? It ain't the beach. So when we come to church, we don't come like we're coming to the beach. <laughs> we come with an attitude of gratitude, an uh, attitude of honor, an, ad an, an attitude that we want to bless God and be a blessing to his people. Amen? If you got, if, if somebody, or if you're married, if you go out for fine dining, Anybody ever go fine dining, eat fine dining, five-star restaurant, you know, with the tablecloths, and they pull the table out to let you in and push it at, and they scrape your crumbs off, and <laughs> there ain't no straw wrappers on that table. <laughs> There's not going to be any splinter packets laying around that table. They keep that table clean, but let me just say, you ain't going dressed to the beach there either. You know, there are some places that re have require, tie, requ a tie required I don't know if I've seen any of those in California. Or, but they do have places that jacket is required. A jacket is required. And they don't mean a jean jacket. <laughs> Amen. We've got to, let me just say, we've got to approach God in a way that we're honoring him. Because when we honor God, 
When we honor God with our lives, our hearts and souls, guess what happens? And he doesn't have to. But this is how God operates. When we live a life of honoring him, he honors us. Though you might feel like we don't even deserve it. He loves us so much because the whole kingdom of God operates on this principle, seed time and harvest. You honor God and he will absolutely honor you. He will honor you so much that when you walk in a place, people will look at you. People that aren't even saved will look at you and say, that is a Christian. Heathen will say, those are Christians. And they'll, like, how did you know? And they're like, I don't even know how I know. Do you ever have somebody say something to you about, they just know there's something about God about you. I said people back when, I, I was in my late 20s, and people would say, what is it about you? And I go, Jesus. It's just Jesus. I love Jesus. Jesus loves me. Amen. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that God gives us opportunities to hear a message more than one time? And that sometimes when we hear the same message, that we'll hear it in a different way. So that we can make the adjustments. Amen. Because what is that quote? A life not examined is not a life worth. Okay, I got I to gotta remember that. The unexamined life is not worth living. And we're quoting who? Plato. <laughs> An unexamined life is not a life worth living. So God says in his word, examine yourself. Find out where you're at. Don't get condemned. The message is never to condemn you. The message is just to correct. And it doesn't mean God doesn't love us. How many of you ever had your kids, or, or maybe you've been a kid, you had children that acted or talked or did some things or been around them and have been just being a brat? Anybody know? Chase isn't here, so I'll use him as an example. Because <laughs> he was a really busy little boy. <laughs> I was like, get off the rafters. Could somebody get him off the counter? I don't know why. He just always wanted to get up higher than he was. <laughs> Like we go to the park on the swing set, the swings, there's things you can climb up. He, no, he didn't want to get on the place you're supposed to climb high. He wanted to get up on the bar above the swings. I'm like, why? There's other places that are safer that you can walk up the stairs and get up on things. You don't have to go there where if you fall. And he has, and he has fallen. <laughs> it was like, what were you thinking? Why are you up there? But sometimes, you know, kids will do things, and you're like, what are you thinking? So just because I yelled at Chase, what are you thinking? <laughs> Doesn't mean I didn't love him. Oh, my gosh. Love him. Squeeze them to pieces. Let's go to Outback so you can get your Joey steak and your ranch and go to Krispy Kreme and get your donut. At the same time, what the heck were you thinking? <laughs> Love them to pieces. I want to slap the living daylights out of them. Why? Because he could do much bodily harm in all the things that he thought were fun. Why are you going down the driveway that fast? <laughs> so, so God sees and loves us dearly as his children. And he sees that we're doing things the wrong way. And he's saying, stop it. You're bringing harm to yourself. So much harm that it's hurting your family. Get back in line. And I'm going to impact you so much that it's going to bless you and your whole family. Amen? Aren't you glad that God takes his time to deliver his word to us so that we can make all the adjustments? Amen? When we were going down to these meetings, I was so excited and I was so hungry because, you know, I was getting to hear two of my favorite 
preacher ladies. I was like, oh, I was like, guys always ask me, you know, whenever I'm going somewhere, are you excited? I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I'm happy. I don't know. <laughs> I just don't feel like I'm always kind of happy. So I figure that's I keep myself at a. <laughs> I'm always like this. <laughs> and so but I was going down there. I was excited. <laughs> I was like, I'm excited. This is going to be good. We're going to be some Holy Ghost meetings. The first night we get there, the line's out the door. I go, woo, we're talking old school. People lining up to get in church. We got there at 6 o'clock and the line's out the door. I was like, this is what I like. That means people are hungry because they're there early. That's how you know. That's how you know when people are hungry. They're there early. If they got to stand in line just to get in the door. Amen. You're my... Favorite preachers, and on the way, I'm just talking to God. I'm like, I'm excited. It was more fun than Disneyland <laughs> with all fast passes. <laughs> think about Disneyland, you think I got to stay in the line. All fast passes. It was more fun than that. I'm driving down, and the Lord goes, You're going for direction and correction. And I was like, Yes, sir. Because God loves me so much. He wants to make sure that I make the corrections and get that direction. Amen? So today, you might have got a little bit of correction, but you definitely got a lot of good direction. Amen? Hallelujah. Thank God for his mercy. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for all eternity, for your patience and your loving, merciful compassion towards us, your people. We thank you, Father God, that your word is never meant to condemn, but to correct and adjust and get direction. We thank you. You love us so much because you're, we're your children and you have a plan for our lives. Holy Spirit, as always, have your way in this place. Have your way in our hearts. Have your way in our bodies. Have your way. Have your way. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, sabravashi kiri on the bowl of Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just reach your hands up to the Lord right now. Reach your hands up to the Lord. Say, Lord God. Thank you so much for revelation. Because of this, you are building in me, in your church, what you want to do. Thank you that I can take correction and get direction for my future and for the future of my family. In Jesus' name.